Hello, I'm Bishop Patrick L. Wooden Sr. and welcome to the Upper Room Broadcast. We're going to take you now into our Thursday night Bible study and we're going to start a new message in our courageous series, Compromising Without Being Compromised. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were a part of King Nebuchadnezzar's uh, administration. He had a dedication to his false idol, this, this image that he set up. And he invited all of his administration to show up. And these guys, they compromised. They went. But when the time came, they showed that they had not been compromised, for they stood for the God of the Bible. Join us. It's going to bless you real good. This is our Thursday night Bible study. I want to talk about compromising without being compromised. And I want to begin by saying something that I'm going to say again, that in the Holiness Church and amongst traditionalists and those of us who love the Lord, the word compromise, let me get this out the way, is a dirty word. Because all kinds of things come to mind when you think about compromising. But I want to talk about compromising without being Compromise. All right? Now, in this teaching, I want to take a look at there are some things I want you to be looking for me to talk to you about tonight. Uh, the image of God that the world has created versus the image of God that the Lord is making us into. See, the world has an image. There's a God-made, world-made image. That's a false God. Then there is the image of God that we are being made into. So the, the, one of the things is, uh, will the image of God that he's made in us bow to the man-made image of God? See, there is something that the Lord is doing in every one of us. Will we take what God is doing in us and bow to the man-made image of God. I said this to, uh, to several people. I've been testing this. The Lord showed me something about our current president that I rather admire about him. I said this to someone, and they said, there's something about President Obama that you admire. I want to hear this. And I said, yes, I'm very serious about it. I actually admire him. To understand him, um, our president, you got to understand that President Obama is an ideologue. He's a strict ideologue. Um, and, and to give you some idea, let's compare him to President Bill Clinton. President Bill Clinton was not an ideologue. President Bill Clinton was a pragmatist. Whatever, whichever way, whatever way the wind blew, if the polls showed that the people were for a thing, Clinton would adopt that thing. If it looked like it was going to pass Congress, even if it was a position opposite his, it's called triangulation, he would get ahead of it and take it and claim it as his own. That was his style, if you were paying attention back in the Clinton day. Okay? President Obama is just the opposite. He has a set of beliefs. He has a system. He is a progressive. He is not a pure capitalist. He praises the European socialist system. He says that he wished that our, our medical system was more like Canada. Am I right? He says that he wished that we were more like Europe in terms of borders in Europe. 
the, the countries can you can go from one country to the other, just pass through freely. And that he's a ideologue. And he sticks to that. Um, even when it may look like he looks, it may, it may call, it may appear him, it may cause him to appear to be tone deaf, or whatever the case may be, but he sticks to his script. All right. What I admire about him, even though I don't 90% of the time I disagree with his, his script. I admire that he would stick to it. Wouldn't it have been something if the church would have stuck to its script? The same way he sticks to his. He said to the black church, I look like you. I want you to vote for me. but I'm not going to deviate from my script to get you to vote for me. But vote for me because I look like you. We said to him, you look like us. I know what our script, <clears throat> the Bible, says, but we'll lay that aside to vote for you because you look like us. But he wouldn't lay aside his script to get our vote. We didn't need to vote for him, but he needed to get our vote. But he was more committed to his script. And I don't think anybody can disagree with that. If you raise your hand, I'll give you the mic right now. We're streaming live. We're on, we can have a good debate. He did not compromise his script. Even when he came out and said, I'm, I'm for, now he did delay it because in, in 2008, he did believe in same-sex marriage. But Isakoff said to him, and all of this is in my teaching tonight, said, you should tell the black community that you believe this right now. Because in 96, he filled out a Democrat questionnaire for a lesser position. He said in 96 that he was for same-sex marriage. So that was no evolving. That was an elaborate hoax to fool the simple. That over time, he, in four years, came around. Well, if you believe that, I got a bridge to sell you. That, 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 things like that don't happen. You don't, uh, you don't, that don't happen. So, um, but in, in, two, in, in, the, in 2012, he came out full bore with his script. And who blinked was the church. Praise the Lord. One of the things that we're going to have to grab hold to if we're going to be saved and in a courageous way as time goes on, is our script, our doctrine, what we believe. Not what you feel, not what you think, but what we believe. Because more and more, what we believe is going to be challenged. And what we're trying to do is come up with a new brand of Christianity, a Christianity that encourages you, a Christianity that lifts you up, a Christianity that consoles you, a Christianity that makes you feel good, a Christianity that will give you money, a Christianity that will bring you out, but it's not a Christianity that disciplines, controls, nor guides. You can do what you want to do, but our God, uh, you know, like some of these songs, if I was this, and uh, you know, all the Lord has called us to do is, is just praise. No, 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 no. We're called to do more than praise. We're called to live something. Say amen. Come on up, room. I got a good, thir I got a good Thursday night crowd, but they're acting like, they're acting like Presbyterians tonight. Say amen. Now, I'm going to show you something. I'm going to show you something. Now, I'm headed somewhere. Now, in our text, we see something interesting. Nebuchadnezzar, uh, king of Babylon in chapter 2 has a dream. Okay? Now the interesting thing about this dream is he dreams a dream that disturbs him. I mean this dream shakes him up. But he forgets the dream.
He remembers Beth that he's shook, shaken up. He's disturbed, but he can't remember the dream. So he calls all of his wise men together, all of the astrologers of Babylon, all of those who are supposed to be able to get in touch with the spirits. And he said to them, look, uh, I have had a dream, but I can't remember my dream. Follow me now. He said to the one of you, whoever can tell me my dream, according to verse 5, he says, uh, and the king answered and said unto the Chaldeans, the thing is gone from me. If you will, uh, look, look at this. He says, now, if you will not make known unto me the dream with the interpretation, you shall be, look at this, cut in pieces. And your house shall be made a dunghill. Now, can you imagine what, the, what all those uh, astrologers and sorcerers and how they felt standing before the king? He says, now, I've had this dream. I've forgotten the dream. Now, I want you to tell me what the dream is. But if you can't tell me, guess what? He said, what? I'm going to cut all of y'all in pieces. I'm going to make your, your home, your house, a toilet. He says, but now to the ones the whoever can interpret the dream, verse 6, he shall receive of me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore, show me the dream and the interpretation thereof. So what they did, they tried to buy time. But he recognized their attempt to buy time. He says, you're just talking. You're trying to buy time, and I'm telling you right now, there is no time to be bought. I have had a dream. I'm disturbed by my dream, but I can't remember the dream. And if I can't remember the dream, I certainly can't remember the interpretation of the dream. But that's bad when a man like that is in charge. That's called, see, what, 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 what they were up against was uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar was the king. He was total, totalitarian. See, a, to a totalitarian government means one party rules and that one party is ruled by a dictator and there is no means of, uh, you can't appeal, whatever that dictator says, go. Well, he was the king and his party ruled and that was it. So if he says, I'm going to cut you into pieces, if you can't remember my dream and give me the interpretation, uh, you may as well start filling your body parts. Because you, you're on your way to being cut into pieces. And they couldn't do it. And uh, the threat also included Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Better known as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So what Daniel does is, uh, Daniel goes, and according to verse 16 and 17, he goes and get with his companion. He tells his buddies what's going on. He says, man, listen, this guy's getting ready to cut us into pieces, and uh, we, we need to tell him what he dreamed and give him the interpretation of the dream. Now, that's asking a hard, unreasonable thing. It's like some people walk up to me and say, Pastor, you know, I want to I work in the church. What is the Lord telling you? <laughs> I mean, with all that I'm doing... Probably nothing. You know, you got the Bible says, whatsoever your hands find to do, do with all your might. You can't put that on me, you know. <laughs> so I, what I do is say, well, I'm going to pray and I'll get back with you. Got to let the Lord speak to me on this. Oh, God. So um, Daniel prayed. The Bible says in verse 19, then was Daniel... Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. And Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and, and might are his. And he changeth the times and the seasons. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. 
He revealeth the deep and secret things. He knoweth what is in the darkness, and the light dwelleth with him. I thank thee and praise thee. This is a doxology. Oh, thou God of my fathers, who have given me wisdom and might and has made known unto me now what we desire of thee. For thou hast uh, now made known unto us the king's matter. Isn't that, isn't that powerful? And so uh, if you read on, you'll see where Daniel went to Arioch and told him that uh, uh, I know the interpretation of the dream. You, 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 you're not going to cut us up. And Daniel gives him the interpretation. He, t he gives him, he tells him what he dreamed and the interpretation of the dream. The king was so blessed, uh, and you can read the, the, uh, the, the dream and the, the interpretation um, uh, if you start uh, studying at verse 31, to save time, I won't go into that, 31 down to um, verse 30, uh, 40, 45. So he tells him what he dreamed. He gives him the interpretation of the dream, which, which in the interpretation, he lets the king know you are great in power, you are the man, you are ruling, but he also lets him know other kingdoms will come after you which was a problem for Nebuchadnezzar to know that. But he was glad that somebody gave him, told him what he dreamed that he forgot and the interpretation. The Bible says, uh, now I'm sure how powerful this man was. He was so, and he was beside himself. He thought he could just make up a new religion. The Bible says then, verse 46, then uh, the king Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face, worshiped Daniel and commanded that they should offer an oblation and sweet odors unto Daniel. And the king said unto Daniel, uh, and, and, and the king answered unto Daniel and said, of a truth it is that your God is a God of God. Now Nebuchadnezzar never believed that Daniel's God was the only God. He's a God of gods and a Lord of kings and a revealer of the secrets, seeing thou couldest reveal this secret. Then the king made Daniel a, look at this, a great man and gave him many great gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon. You're talking about um, a promotion, and the chief of the governors, and over all the wise men of Babylon. You're talking about he made him rich, made him great, gave him power, promoted him. He said, well, did Daniel turn it down? No, he took it. Well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> got, got elevated and elevated and elevated. And then the Bible says, but, but he didn't forget his prayer partner. He didn't forget the men that uh, helped pray the answer through. The Bible says, verse 49, then Daniel requested of the king, and he set Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the provinces of Babylon. But Daniel sat in the gate of the king. Now, the positions that were given to Daniel and that was given to his companions were positions that were held according to the Chaldean teachings, were positions that were reserved for the master race. And the master race in the eyes of the Chaldeans were the Chaldeans. It is amazing that four Jews, children of the captivity, got elevated like this. That had never happened before. That was totally unheard of. That four Jews of the captivity, basically slaves, would get elevated to these master positions that were heretofore reserved for the creme de la creme, the best of the Chaldees. So these guys get master positions. 
elevated, and listen, once they got in the, in the, in, in the position, they had to perform. And perform they did. So they're elevated. These guys have status. They have, uh, they have power. Uh, and they're in a strong, strong, strong place. So at least uh, the four Hebrew boys who would not eat the king's meat, wouldn't, wouldn't uh, 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 eat his meat, wouldn't drink his drink, who made their stand for the Lord. Now we see these guys as being rich men, powerful men, elevated men. And uh, somebody said, well, that stuff don't matter. Well, the Bible, teaches, the Bible says he made him great. So for, so for those who say, well, there are no differences in people, the Bible says he made him a great man. So you generally hear that from people who are underachievers. But there is such thing as greatness. Oh, yeah. I said, well, you know, I, in my eyes, everybody's the same. Well, that's not scripture. He made him a great man. That means he wasn't a great man <laughs> till the king got through elevating. Made him a great man, gave him these powerful positions, moved him, them up. And as soon as they're, they're in this, the, the, these positions, follow me now, and they are lifted up, look at what happens. Nebuchadnezzar, the king, made an image. Now, what was probably on his mind was something that Daniel said that stayed with him. If you go back to chapter 2 and verse 37, Daniel says this to uh, this uh, powerful man who was a, uh, a, a, a totalitarian and uh, a megalomaniac. You suffer from megalomania. You suffer from visions of uh, 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 delusions of grandeur. You think you're the best thing that ever happened. So it's bad when he's the king, he's a totalitarian, and a megalomaniac, all in one man. <laughs> and he's in charge, and there's nobody to appeal to. King Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel gets the vision and says something that you don't say to a megalomaniac. You don't suggest to a megalomaniac that there's somebody coming after him. Verse 37 of chapter 2 says, Thou, O king, art a great king of kings, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, strength, and strength, and glory. You see that? He's interpreting the, the, the dream. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the, of the heavens hath he given into thine hand and hath made thee ruler over all, over them all. Thou art this head of gold. The statue he saw had a head of gold, a chest of, uh, of, of brass, and so forth and so on. The head was gold, but the whole statue wasn't gold which suggests that the, the statue was pregnable. You could, it was not impregnable. It was strong, but that it, it, it would be brought down. Okay? So he says the head of it was gold. Verse 39, he says, And after thee, now you're a great king, but after thee shall arise another kingdom. Look at this. Another kingdom inferior to thee, and a, and a third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. So he says, you're going to have your day, but you're not going to rule forever. Well, the megalomaniac don't want to hear that. I mean, his problem is, what do you mean after me? There is no after me. I'm the king. <laughs> I will reign uh, from now on. Babylon will rule forever. So what does he do? The king goes down to the land of Dura and he builds this statue. Um, he really overdoes it. I mean, it's, it's, it's way overdone. 90 feet tall. 
made of gold. Some argue that it was uh, gold plated with gold leaflets uh, covering the, the front that, that uh, in terms of, of the gold, uh, the, the only material that was covering the statue was gold, okay? And it was uh, 90 feet tall, um, nine feet wide. And as I said earlier, this image of Nebo set up in the province, in the plain of Dura, which also, I mean, it shows the brilliance of the man. Now, he, he, you know, he, he's not going to put this statue out in some ugly place. He's going to put this statue in a beautiful place. So everything, everything around it spoke to its grandeur. Okay? And every, everything I'm telling you now um, uh, will come into play. So he puts it in a beautiful place. I mean, he beautifies the grounds and builds this huge temple and, and, and erects the thing. And then he calls and he sends for the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, the rulers of the province to come to the dedication. Well, guess who was in this group? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were a part of his administration. Are you with me? They had to show up. They had to heed his call. They had to compromise. They knew before they went that they were going to the dedication of this statue that was erected. Because notice what the text says, that uh, he called for all of them to go to the dedication. They didn't think that they were going to worship Yahweh. Do you see that? In, in verse 2. I'm, I'm not hearing anybody. It says, and all the rulers of the province to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar, the king, had set up. They knew that they were not going to, an, a, to dedicate anything to Yahweh. They were well aware of the purpose of the gathering. Experience this message in its entirety by calling 877-463-3477 to purchase your copy in CD or DVD format. God First will return next week at the same time. Until then, make every day a God First day.